to Black Nouveau. This is our edition for November 19th, 2014. I'm Joanne Williams. Annette Polly Williams, Wisconsin's longest serving female legislator, was laid to rest yesterday. We'll remember her service to our community. We'll tour the Harvey B. Gantt Center for African American Arts and Culture, and we'll preview this year's Fresh Coast Classic. You know, Robert Townsend has a long and impressive list of movies and television shows that he directed, produced, or starred in. But it was his classic Hollywood shuffle that brought him to the Oriental Theater in Milwaukee in October. Robert Townsend didn't act like the big time movie star that he is. He burst through the crowd, smiling and willing to shake hands and talk to anybody. The Milwaukee Film Festival featured his groundbreaking movie, Hollywood Shuffle, as the centerpiece of its Black Lens series. Eight movies by black filmmakers that would not be able to be seen in a true classic movie theater like this anywhere else. Hollywood Shuffle was done in 12 days, over two and a half years. Uh, 12 of the hardest days of my life. You talk about uh, scouting locations, running from the police. You know, if the police couldn't see us, it was a good location. Um, all my friends, one of my uh, friends in the back uh, started producing a movie with me, Mr. Bobby McGee. He's going to come up here and talk to me afterwards. <laughs> Mr. McGee in the back. Um, the film was done in part. I had $60,000 in the bank. I had just finished a movie called A Soldier's Story. And I told my agent, I said, I want to do more movies like this. You know, it was directed by Norman Jewison. It was me, Denzel, Adolph Caesar, Howard Rollins. And my agent said, they only do one black movie a year, Robert, and you just did it. And I auditioned for The Color Purple, and I didn't get the part of Harpo, so I missed my black movie. So I decided I would make my own movie. And so Hollywood Shuffle was the first time I ever directed, picked up the camera. And um, so tonight, uh, you know, I, I'm proud of this movie, uh, and I hope you enjoy it for some of you that have not seen it. And uh, we're going to have a discussion afterwards. So ladies and gentlemen, this is Hollywood Shuffle. is an Eddie Murphy type. What is happening with your cool vines? Thank you, thank you. That You're the worst actor I've ever seen in my life. Then they said I wasn't black enough for the part. Ricky, can you tell us what you've been doing since you've graduated? Well, Robert, I've played nine crooks, four gang leaders, two dope dealers. I played a rapist twice. Whoa. That was fun. They'll never play the Rambos until they stop playing the Sambo. Yeah! I would say that Hollywood Shuffle is my journey as a young actor of color in Hollywood. The obstacles that I had to face, um, semi-autobiographical, and uh, I think it's very funny, you know, because we got funny people in it, and it's a touching story too. What's changed in 2014? Um, I, th I think there have been a lot of changes in Hollywood. Uh, when I think about Shonda Rhimes and I think about her doing Scandal and then now the new show, How to Get Away with Murder. Denzel right now is one of the biggest stars in Hollywood in terms of the box office. So we've made a lot of inroads, but you know, there's still more work to be done. What I tell new filmmakers is technology makes it so affordable to make a movie, to make a short film, to do anything, is just conquering the fear. I think what holds a lot of people back is fear. They're afraid that they may fail instead of understanding that anything you do is a lesson that you can learn from. Take the lesson. So failure is something good? Failure is a necessary brick for success, you know, because you learn more when you go like, okay, why didn't it work? Okay, oh man, I had to rewrite that, I had to re-edit that. Oh, I, that wasn't the right scene, I need to reshoot it. So if you can be patient, because I believe there are no accidents. I just think that sometimes, you know, you're being delayed because there's a bigger blessing at the end of the rainbow. His buddy, and sometimes producing partner, Bobby McGee, the one wearing the orange badge, had not been to Milwaukee before. Townsend, from the west side of Chicago, is familiar with Brewtown. In fact, he shared a very personal story about an earlier visit. I had a very emotional moment when I was in Milwaukee. I was here, and they were honoring me for something. I can't remember what it was. I want to say about 15 years ago. And it was some kind of dinner and this woman sang a song to me, A Hero Comes Along. And she's here tonight. And she sang this song, and I started crying like a baby because it was just like the way she sang it. And it was kind of like my father was uh, not in my life when I was a kid. He was a good guy, but he just wanted to run the streets. 
And uh, when she sang that song, it reminded me, me of my father, because on his deathbed, you know, I, I, I took care of him. And it was like, he said, I wish I would have got to know you better. You know, I wish I would have gotten, you know, and it was like at that time, and it just felt, and she sang that song, so I had this big moment in uh, Milwaukee. Robert Townsend seems to be constantly working. He has three projects underway this fall, including one that takes him off the screen and back onto the stage for a series of live performances. Um, there's a film that I finished called Playing for Love, and we're close to distribution. I shot it in Miami last year um, with myself, Sally Richardson, uh, Lawrence Hilton Jacobs, uh, Isai Morales. Um, uh, Thanksgiving, I'm, I just finished directing Bill Cosby on his next comedy special. It's going to be on Netflix. It premieres uh, Thanksgiving. And then I've been working on a one-man show about my life, like all those movies and my whole journey. So I just did that in San Francisco. I workshopped that um, two weeks ago, and then I'll be back up there doing it in January. That's kind of risky, isn't it? A show yeah. about your life? It's really, it's, it's, it's scary, it's frightening. Um, and it's all true. You know, I died a couple of times. I wasn't supposed to be here on a lot of levels. You know, so it's my journey. You know what I mean? Because you'll see the body of work there, but I'm a kid that came from a really rough neighborhood on the west side of Chicago with gangs everywhere. And I ran down the Rona alleys a couple of times, but you know, God was always watching over me. So it's kind of my journey. And then dealing with Hollywood and all the stuff I've been through, dealing with all these Hollywood type of people. That can be just as treacherous as the alleys in Chicago. Oh yeah, same alleys. <laughs> just different wardrobe. <laughs>
art and creativity that I think the Gantt Center, you know, presents in our community. Our permanent collection is a is a host of, of art artists that we've accumulated over the last 40 years. But there is a particular collection that we were gifted by Bank of America, which was the John and Vivian Hewitt collection of African American art, which is which is the foundation of our collection currently. And it's on display now in our in our West Gallery as it has traveled the country and now it's home here at the Gantt. Uh, it is an amazing collection. It, you know, their story as individuals, as a couple of modest means who, who lived their passion, which was collecting art and engaging artists. They were, they, you know, they, they were a place that artists could come and, and, and sell their works, but also promote their works. The gallery re rear end, what, what does it represent? Well, it really represents, really for us, a 40-year journey through our visual arts legacy. Uh, the Gantt Center has been displaying artists over the last 40 years. Quite frankly, we've, we've shown in some capacity over 325 artists over that period of time. And what we wanted to happen in this particular gallery that we refer to this exhibition as 40 and Counting is really about walking back through uh, you know, memory lane, if you will, about the kinds of exhibitions. So these are some of the artists that have been represented over the past five decades. The kind of artists the Gantt Center showcases can be seen in North Carolina native Dr. Eugene Grisby. Dr. Eugene Grisby was one of the, the last masters, if you will. He was an amazing artist, educator, author. Um, you know, he passed away about a year and a half ago, 94 years of age. I had the pleasure of meeting and visiting with him in his home and gallery and in, uh, in studio space in, in, in Arizona and uh, an amazing individual with roots here in Charlotte, roots in the Carolinas. We are honored to bring him back. He still has brothers and sisters and nephews and nieces that live here in the community. And uh, it's just great to be able to honor him in such a way with, uh, with showing some of his selected works. First and foremost, we want people to really see the, the center as a place that they can come and get great appreciation of a culture. Uh, not just the art, but really a culture, and really understanding that. We think the art presents an opportunity for people to expand their level of appreciation. You know, African-American art is so dynamic, and it's in, in terms of what it presents and the messaging in it, that we think it is critical to our youth, and really to our adults as well, in terms of better understanding, you know, a, 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 a community. And uh, when people can walk away, and, and which we hear often, which we're very pleased to hear, that hey, that was a great exhibition. We know that we have, we are making a kind of impact that we would like to make. Whenever I think of Thanksgiving, I think of the Fresh Coast Classic. It's going to tip off next week. Joining us to discuss Milwaukee's eighth annual mix of basketball and scholarship is Russell Thomas, general manager of the Fresh Coast Classic. And it's around Thanksgiving, that's why I think of it. I've now associated your basketball tournament with turkey. That's correct. We've been doing this for eight years, and this is one of the premier uh, basketball tournaments in the area, and we're delighted to be here to talk about it today. Jim. Now, I would say it's, it's one of the premier high school basketball tournaments in the state. Well, I, I don't want to brag, but it's a pretty good it's a pretty good matchup if you look at some of the teams that we've had play in this event over the years. They are from where these teams? Mostly uh, MPS City Conference teams will face off with our uh, suburban southeastern Wisconsin teams from around the area. Mm -hmm. And there's some pretty good teams in there too. Yes. Some some state champions are playing in this in this tournament. Right. Now it's also. Uh, a college fair. Where is that going to take place? That college fair will take place at the UWM College Union in their ballroom and then all of the rooms that we have decided to take over that day on that Tuesday. That's going to be Tuesday, November 25th? That is correct. And in that we will have, oh, I'd say about 4,000 plus MPS students, juniors and seniors uh, attending that event. So UWM should be happy that we're coming. Well, I've been to college fairs, but this is one of the biggest college fairs I've heard of. It's pretty big. What's the advantage of coming to this one? Well, I think uh, it, it, it lends to the fact that we have 60 plus colleges and universities that will be there. And it, it is a nice uh, touch when we can deliver all of our MPS students to 
a college fair of this magnitude to come and see and, and engage and talk to representatives from colleges from around the country. What's the advantage to connect a college fair with a basketball tournament? Well, over the years, the, uh, the Fresh Coast Classic thought that this was an important component. You'll remember that we used to have historically black colleges participating in this event, and one of the beginning stages or genesis of this event was to involve or uh, to offer uh, historically black colleges as a option for our students here in the Milwaukee area, because many simply didn't know that they existed. Now, there's something else going on connected with the Fresh Coast Classic this year, having to do with a couple of Milwaukee high schools and some basketball that was played way back in ancient history. Oh. Well, 1959. Yes. What is it? Uh, this year, we're delighted to uh, honor the 1959 North Lincoln State Championship basketball team. And we're doing this uh, in a collaboration or in connection with the WIA 100th year anniversary of state basketball. We think that this is important that we uh, give this tribute to the men that were involved in this special era. Uh, you may recall, I don't know how old you are, but you may recall that North uh, and Lincoln had runs in the late 50s and 60s. And this 59 team was the first year that both two teams from Milwaukee met in the state championship game in Madison. And that was the first time that happened? That's the first time that happened. Two Milwaukee. Two Milwaukee teams. City teams. Now, there are a lot of people who played on those teams that uh, some of them are still around. They are. And uh, many of them are uh, active members in our community. Some are prominent members in our community. And for fear of uh, not for fear of forgetting some, I'm going to say that all of them were good people. And we think it fitting that we uh, present this tribute to our audience that may be watching this game and for the mem members of our community because they were m very much part of basketball history in Wisconsin. Did you play? I did not play here. I played in New York. Well. That's okay. We won't hold that against you. You're here now helping yes. with the Fresh Coast Classic. Uh, is this, is the college fair and the basketball tournament, is it free or do we have to pay admission? Well, the college fair is free and open to the public. There's a little admission that you have to pay for to get into the games because we have all these expenses, of course, and uh, all of that information is available on our website. Okay, so give me the dates and the locations of the events. Okay, the college fair will take place on Tuesday, November 25th at the UWM College Center. And our drumline and game events will take place on November 28th and 29th at the UWM Klatchy Center. What time will the games be? The games will start at 12 each day with a drumline event on that Friday the 28th at 3.15. Well, the drumline is almost as good as the basketball. We think so. Uh, these young people have been working hard and preparing for this event. There's a big uh, trophy that's going to be given and maybe some cash prizes in addition to for those drumline groups that have worked hard. So give me the uh, way people can get in touch with you. Website? Website is www.freshcoastclassic.org. And you can go there, find out the times, the times, cost. dates, costs, tickets, scheduled events. All right. Thank you very much for coming and joining us today. Russell Thomas from the Fresh Coast Classic. We'll see if we can see some basketball. Well, thank you for having me. And finally tonight, we want to remember the life and legacy of Annette Polly Williams. Liddy Collins talked with her when Polly was retiring from the state legislature. The end basket for Wisconsin State Representative Annette Polly Williams is near empty, as 30 years of representing the Milwaukee 10th District comes to an end. Representative Williams is retiring. 30 years ago, the desire to help and serve the community took Annette Williams to Madison. The very first Juneteenth, 39 years ago, I was at that Juneteenth, and I've been at most of them all of these uh, 39 years. I was working at one of the uh, community-based organizations when we had the first Juneteenth here on, um, it was Third Street at that time. Her work with people in the community had people asking her to run for a political office. She got involved wanting change, 
with encouragement from people of the 17th, now 10th district, she ran and ran three times, though the first time she ran, she missed votes because people didn't know her as a net. When I ran, first ran for office in 1976, uh, at that time you couldn't put nicknames on the ballot. So everybody knew me as Polly, but I had to put Annette Williams. And it was only after the election, of course, I didn't win. People came to me and say, Polly, I didn't know Annette was you. You know, so the next time I ran in 1978, I had Polly legally um, changed so that it was a part of my legal name. William's focus was speaking up for the people on the bottom and was a voice for the voiceless. I was very much involved uh, in education as a citizen in Milwaukee. Um, Back in the late 70s, we were involved in the desegregation when the court order came down to desegregate Milwaukee public schools. I joined in a group in the community that were opposed to the implementation of how the city of Milwaukee was going to implement the deseg program in terms of putting a burden on the backs of our black students. There was triple O organization that was headed by um, Larry Harwell. I joined that group and we protested uh, the DSEG order. And when I came into the legislature, I continued to protest and to fight against all of those pieces of legislation that dealt with uh, the DSEG, the Chapter 220 program, because every last one of those programs, it made the uh, African American students uh, the burden bearers, that all of the, the problems. Um, the burdens of implementing this program was put on the backs of black students and I didn't think that was fair. When I ran for office, I ran on the uh, theme of having representation, having someone elected to office that will be there for the citizens of the community and to really, to really do what we promise. You know, a lot of times when people run for office, we make a lot of promises. But uh, I'm one of those people that really said, I want to go up there and speak for you and fight for you. And I did. I mean, I didn't change just because I got elected. The committee she worked on helped people who needed help the most and were usually connected to education. A bill that she helped get through, the School Parental Choice Bill, will probably be her legacy. The basis of that bill was that we want to empower parents, particularly low-income families, so that they will be able to exercise uh, their options and choices that people with money have always done. That is, choose the best school for your child based on the needs of your child as opposed to the needs of administration. So um, while I have some concerns about where the bill is now, uh, overall I think that it was necessary for us to allow for options for other parents who don't have money. So that's what the Milwaukee Parental Choice Program is all about. Representative Williams said the initial intent of the legislation was never meant to fund schools at 100 percent. They wanted the schools involved in the program to be self-sufficient and have a balance and not have to worry if the state decided to pull the plug, thus shutting down the school. Along with education, she worked on the reapportionment of districts. I did the education thing, uh, which I'm very happy about, but I've also, um, you know, every 10 years there's uh, reapportionment, and so for the, the three decades that I've been here, I've been in court. I've fought, I go to court to fight to make sure that as the population, uh, we have population increases and population shifts, to make sure that African Americans, that we get our full representation at every level of government well, when we do this reapportionment every 10 years. Another powerful venue she used to get information out to the public was the radio. Side so level people that do cook. For about six years, Polly Williams and her three lady friends brought issues to the airwaves via The Breakfast Club on WMCS 1290 radio. And we're still together, you know, we just, um, we have to keep finding ways for us to still get together since we're not getting together every Tuesday morning. When you talk about politi politics, 
It is the politics that help to set the tone for what's going to happen. Polly always brought the latest information, and as everybody who ever listens, she shot straight from the hip. She <laughs> never held back on what she felt was the right thing to do. And so she always helped to interpret things that we would hear in terms of the political information that was being put out there and giving guidance to the community in terms of how should we respond to things, what are things that are urgent, what's the priorities. In, in most instances, um, most legislation or policy decisions don't always reach us right away. It's more like a trickle down that after other people have gotten the benefits, then if there's anything left, you know, maybe we can get it. So, but I like to kind of put us on the front burner. Uh, I put put us out there. The people in most needs, I think that that's where um, the solutions to problems ought to begin with those people with the greatest need, and and the people with some of the greatest needs are those people who are on the low end of the totem pole. And that is our program for this week. For Black Nouveau, I'm Joanne Williams. Thanks for watching.